morning. Pretty good for a small crew. Thank you for that, and welcome to you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we're so glad that you're here. And pray that something happens in this service that touches your heart, that maybe challenges you and encourages you for the week to come. We want to welcome especially those who are worshiping by radio or Facebook Live. And if you're a guest with us today, uh, we hope that you feel a warm welcome from this congregation. Oh, and I've just got to say, there's Claire Pope that just walked in. Yay! <laughs> Welcome home. Welcome home. We're so glad you're here. Would you bow for our invocation? Gracious God of the open door, we thank you that you receive us as we are and call us to welcome one another. Through your spirit of holiness, open wide our hearts and break open your word that you may inspire and guide this time together. Today, O oh God, may we honor your presence in our lives and in one another. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Welcome. Would you please turn with me to hymn number 73, O Worship the King, and we'll stand together as we sing one, two, and five.
great conviction and aspiration as we proclaim the words, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. week y'all got something really cool and I kind of feel like I've got to outdo it almost I wasn't here last week oh Warren Warren's pretty bummed I said well that's what happens when you play ball on Sunday instead of coming to church you don't get the cool thing that Mr. Reggie had did any of you get one Price Parker you got one there's one of the Wesley Center still in a Ziploc bag is that yours is that Parker's maybe he had a they're called stalagmite is that what it is and you you crack it open and it showed all the cool jewels inside. Well, I've got a trick today. You ready? Well, I've got a question first. What is trust? What does it mean to trust? To believe someone? To tell the truth? Like to, um, how, how could you say it? Where, where, who do you trust? God? God, Jesus, her best friend. You best. What about your mama or your dad? Okay, okay. I'm gonna say that I, I'm the best friend you were talking about, right, Sawyer? No, that's not what she meant. Look, you remember everything you promise. You trust them. Have you ever trusted God? Yes. What? Why? Why would you trust God? Oh, that's a tough one, right? He keeps his promises, right? We in Sunday school we talked about how we talked about the golden calf, how Moses was on top of the mountain talking to God about the commandments. God was giving him those rules for the people to follow, and down there at the bottom of the mountain, they were getting a little antsy. They were kind of tired of waiting on Moses. They couldn't see God. They couldn't see Moses. They thought they had abandoned him. And so they, they had Aaron get everybody's gold jewelry and melt it down to this calf, right? And they were like, this, this is somebody we can put our trust into. This, this gold calf made out of jewelry. But who was actually waiting for them? God, right? God was there the whole time. He knew what was going on. He even told Moses, he said, Moses, I'm not too happy with your people down there. They're doing some things they shouldn't do. And Moses said, God, remember what you promised them. We, we can do this. Well, I need a volunteer this morning to see if you can trust me. Oh, Eli. Come on, Eli. Sit right here. Okay. Warren, come hold this microphone for me. So 
talk about trust and how hard it is sometimes to trust people or um, to have to put our trust into someone, even when if we can't see them there, right? All right, so I've got a glass of water here. You've seen this trick before? Oh, well, let's see if we can make it. All right, so I'm going to tilt this water upside down over Eli's head. Do you trust me? Do you trust me, Eli? Did you try this before? I did, did I try it before this? Oh, no. No, I'm just winging it, right? Okay. Right, what do you think, Eli? You have a towel? Okay. Okay, I don't have a towel, and Eli does not have any more clothes. Okay, if I let go, what's going to happen? He's going to fall on me. Uh, it worked. Okay, so what do you think? Don't touch it. Don't touch it. I can't promise how long it's going to go there. What, it, what happened, though? The water didn't come out, right? I mean, it, it kind of did. I'm not going to take it off and then tilt it over. I do not have that type of, type of um, power in me, although Jesus could, right? He could tilt it over. No, you cannot tilt it over my head. We talk about trust, and that's not one thing I would do. Well, we know that the pressure was holding the, the water from the card over. And we couldn't see it, though, could we? But we knew it was working. Just like God. Just like we know that God is there. We can't see him always. But we know that he's there holding us up and supporting us too. Just like he knew what the people at the bottom of the mountain were doing, how, how tired and antsy and how they were grumbling and over waiting in the wilderness for so long. He, they still put their trust in God. And even though Eli may not have wanted to put his trust in me, I, I knew what I was doing with that. And God knows what he's doing too. So that's someone we should always feel confident to put our trust to and to always turn to him when we feel like we're alone or afraid. Right, guys? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being the one that we can always trust to, for always keeping your promises and being there with us when we're afraid, when we're scared, when there's new things coming our way. God, help us to always remember that we can trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. Kelly and children, we appreciate that um, instruction about trust and leaning into the future without fear. Our sermon series is, is all about trust. This is a time when we pause to offer up our prayers to God, and you'll offer most of them just privately and personally in your hearts. Some we lift aloud. We um, draw your attention to the concerns on the back of the bulletin. Those are the most recent ones, but I want to remind you that in the newsletter that comes out twice a month, there's a very comprehensive list there, and then a list, if you want to take one home, available um, in the narthex on a table out there. I, I want to uh, give thanks to the Harris family for these beautiful flowers, and we remember this morning Tyler on his what, October 12th um, birth date. We pray for Israel. Let us pray constantly for that situation and that they might find a way of peace there. We know that God has remembered what we have forgotten and is hard at work on things we know nothing of. We pause for just a short moment of simple silence so that you can lift up privately your own personal prayers of petition and thanksgiving. And so in these moments, let us pray. In your mercy, O oh God, hear these quiet prayers of your people. You are our great God of compassion.
and we come to you with hopeful and trusting hearts. In our spoken words and in our deepest thoughts, we lift up to you the needs of ourselves and the world. Our guilt longs for your mercy. Our dis-ease seeks your healing. Come and raise us up, we pray. We give you praise for the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you forgive us and give us power to begin anew. This morning, touch those secret places in our lives that most need change and transformation. Touch those places in our community, our nation, and our world that are in such desperate need of healing. Help us to see where your love and mercy bind us together. And help us to know that there is so much more that unites us than divides us. We ask that you would give us the faith to fall at the feet of Jesus. Forgive us when we are blind to all you have done and forgive us for taking so very much for granted. We come to you this morning in humble gratitude and ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we might know your presence in great and profound ways. Give us a word of encouragement for the week to come. But challenge us too, O oh Lord, that we might better serve you as we serve our neighbor. And now, gentle and mighty creator, for these things we have named on our lips and those things we have named in our hearts, we beseech you to hear our prayers in the name of the one who came teaching us to pray when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let's we'll stand together for our offertory hymn number 400 in your hymnals. We'll sing all three stanzas. Stand with me.
scarcity, but a God of abundance. And the gifts that we share now are a measure of our faith in that abundance. And so may we give generously from our hearts, from our minds, and from our actions.
Thank, Thank you, you, Susan. Our lay readers for this month have been members of our youth group, and Price uh, Russell is bringing the reading for this morning. Good morning. I'm reading Hebrews 10, chapter 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And from all the more as you see the day approaching. And from Joshua 1, nine, I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For the word of God, for the people of God. Thank you, Price. Now, some of you adults, when I ask you to be lay reader, I want you to remember Price doing that this morning. It's possible for you, too, to be a lay reader. Will you bow with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth, Almighty God, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we continue this morning talking about the future. We've had a couple of Sundays to do that already. We talk specifically about leaning into the future without fear, which is a hard thing to do sometimes, whether the future holds uh, promise or challenge. Because it's unknown, it's hard to lean into the future without fear, but it's possible. It's not that the future always instills fear in us. It doesn't. But it can because it's, it's unknown. And we tend to have a fear of the unknown. We like clarity. We want exactness and precision before we take a step. But that's not what faith is all about, is it? We can make assumptions about the future. We can make predictions based on past experience. We can project the future based on baseless Fears, and there's a lot of baseless fears out there in the world these days. But we can't know the future until it finally arrives. And arrive it will. I suggested two weeks ago that of the few things in life that we can absolutely count on, the future is one of them. It's coming, it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. Two Sundays ago, I suggested that people who lean into the future take risks, and we do. Last Sunday, I suggested that people who lean into the future admit that they don't know everything, but God does. And this morning, people who lean into the future without fear can do so because we know we are not alone. The beautiful anthem that Susan sang this morning was by my request. You won't find it in the hymnal, strictly speaking. I guess it's not a religious or Christian song at all. It's from the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Carousel. But don't the lyrics sound like a psalm, like you could have lifted it right out of the psalms? Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It's like a psalm. One of the reasons we can lean into the future without fear is because we do not go there or arrive there alone, on our own. We just don't. That's not to say that it cannot be lonely because it can, but we're not alone. And the challenge for us is to remember that, though lonely, not alone. 
What are some instances when we feel that we are all alone? Now, you can just think on your own and come up with probably lots of examples from your own life when maybe you have felt that way. What about grief and adjusting to the new normal after someone we love has died? Can feel awfully alone. What about facing a diagnosis of malignant and the chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery that follows can be a place where we feel alone? Going through a divorce and sometimes losing all of your friends because of that or seemingly to lose your friends. We can feel all alone. Or what about facing an addiction? And it doesn't have to be one of the illegal ones. It could be food, alcohol. It's a slippery slope, the, the addiction one. We sometimes feel alone because of some of the things we've just named. And in order to numb ourselves, to numb that feeling of being alone, we reach out for a substance of some kind. And it works for a little while. It really does. Because for a little while, we just don't feel anything. We get a, a momentary respite when it feels like everything is okay. But eventually, the effects wear off and we feel more alone than ever. You've got your own examples of times when you have felt alone in your life, but while we may have felt lonely, we are not alone. I just named some of the more difficult examples of facing the future and feeling alone, but even with, when the prospect of the future is a good one, it can still feel as if we enter into it all by ourselves. What about awaiting the birth of a baby? Hopefully we're surrounded by family and friends who love and support us, but ultimately it's the mother carrying the baby, and the mother will birth that baby. Undoubtedly, there's got to be moments when that mother may feel that she faces the future alone. And yet that's something good that we anticipate, the coming of a child. Or what about if you're starting a new job? It's exciting. Hopefully it's filled with promise and possibility. But when you walk through the door on that very first day, it can feel like you're out there on your own. You don't know anybody, don't even know where your desk is, aren't sure of what the expectations are. And young adults, I mean, we get excited for them graduating and going off to college, but we forget how nervous we were in those days. Leaving home for the very first time. They may know that there have been other young adults who have done the same thing for hundreds of years and survived. And they may know, well, I'll survive too. But suddenly it can feel as if all future decisions fall on their shoulders alone, no one else's. And what about in our church? When can it feel like we enter into the future on our own, in our own church? We may be surrounded by members of the community of faith, but, but maybe our ideas for what the future should hold for our church are different than anyone else's. And you know that sometimes church folk get sideways with one another. We think about it. We do. And sometimes we get sideways with one another because we disagree on what's best for the church. I mean, at the heart of things, hopefully we're seeking God's will and wisdom, but it doesn't keep us from letting our egos get just a little bit involved. And gosh, what if the pastor disagrees with us too? When this happens and when it creates tension and anxiety, it may be because we've stopped seeking God's vision for our church and think we know best. 
but we don't know the future for certain, so we can't know that we know best or not. But the bottom line is, we never enter the future alone. Oh, the future can feel and even be lonely, as I've said. But ultimately, we're not alone, and embracing that fact makes taking the chance of walking forward into the unknown possible in the first place. I'm going to say it again. Ultimately, we're not alone. And if we will embrace that fact, it makes the chance of walking forward into the unknown possible. The Bible is filled with examples of those who may have felt that they were alone going into their future. Abraham and Sarah sent Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness on their own. Hagar did not know what the future held and suspected that her son would die. But she did know this. She did know to cry out to the Lord for the sake of her child, and she and the child were saved. After he was baptized by the Holy Spirit, Jesus went out into the wilderness because the Holy Spirit forced him out into the wilderness. But he was not alone because the Holy Spirit accompanied him and his own faith in God delivered him from the hands of the devil himself. But I'll bet when he took that first step into the wilderness, I'll bet Jesus may have felt a little alone, even Jesus Mary was no more than 13 or 14 when she became pregnant with Jesus. Think about that. How alone must she have felt? But you know what God did? God instructed her to go to Elizabeth and there to be encouraged and reminded she's not alone. Elijah, instructed by God to go to the desert of Cherwith, but he did not face starvation because who brought him something to eat? The raven brought him something. The line from the anthem, with hope in your heart, you'll never walk alone. With hope in your heart, we will never walk alone. In verse 23, the writer of Hebrews reminds the people to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And remember that in the Bible, hope is not just a wish or a dream. Hope is an absolute expectation that something will happen that God will do something in our lives. Will do. Future tense. And the hope that Paul writes of is one that urges tenacity in maintaining hope, which by definition pulls us into the future. The tenacity of maintaining hope and hope, by definition, will pull us into the future. Because hope is not only with us, but it goes before us as well. Pulls us into the future forward beyond what we presently see or experience. Because sometimes it's what we see and experience in front of us that creates the fear of the future. And we can't quite push through it. But Paul says, hope pulls us forward into the future beyond what we presently see or experience. So leaning into the future without fear is something we can do with hope and thus we do with God. He who has promised is faithful, is what Paul says. And then he goes on to remind the people that the hope 
of the future it is lodged at least in part in the community of believers and Paul encourages them to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Provoke one another to love and good deeds. That's what the community of faith now and the one we meet in the future draws us into. And he goes on, not neglecting to meet together. Not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. People who lean into the future without fear know that they are not alone. Now, I said that as a general statement, but perhaps I should be a little more specific. Easter people, people of Christ who lean into the future without fear can do it because we know we are not alone. Joshua was Moses' right-hand man assisted him in getting the Hebrew people to the promised land, and Joshua assumed that Moses would go there with them, that he would always have Moses for instruction and guidance to lean on. But Moses never made it to the promised land, did he? Before he crossed the River Jordan, it tells us Moses died. Suddenly, leadership is unpredictable, and sometimes leadership of this faithless group of Israelites falls to a new person, and it fell to Joshua. What was he to do without Moses? Well, it didn't matter what the future held for them, as long as Joshua could remember this, Yahweh's words, I hereby command you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord our God is with us wherever we go. People who lean into the future without fear know that not only does God go with them, but God goes before them and is already there in the future waiting for them, for us. Now, just saying that, that God is with us, may seem like a no-brainer. Well, sure, it's so obvious. But it is sometimes the very first thing that we forget when we face fear. Our feeling of being alone overpowers our awareness of God's presence. Our faith thins. So to say that God goes with us may seem like a no-brainer, but sometimes it's the first thing we forget, or we simply have taken the fact for granted for so long that we no longer feel God's presence with us. But God's there. The witness of the word reminds us of this over and over and over, as the stories I've just told tells us. Matt Mayofsky says that we follow a God who wants to change our lives, who doesn't want us to be the same people tomorrow that we are today. And then he goes on to say, we don't have to manage change alone. We can do this together. And more important, God is right alongside us, preparing a future for us that we may not be able to feel or see for ourselves. But God does. People who lean into the future without fear know they are not alone. God will not leave us where we are. 
I reminded the folks on Wednesday night that I'd said that the first two sermons in this series and that I was going to say it again this Sunday. God will not leave us where we are. God is always and everywhere asking that we become someone new so we can live in a new way and discover a new vision for life and purpose for existing. We may not have the answer now, but it's out there. It's waiting for us. If we will step into the future in hope and without fear and know we are never alone. What did the song say? Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, for your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. Will you pray with me? God, we know that the future is coming, that we can count on it. We can simply wait and allow it to happen to us. Or we can learn from the witness of your word of things that strengthen us as we put one foot in front of the other. And knowing, O oh God, that you are ever present is perhaps the most important thing of all. And so for those of us who may not feel that presence this morning, I ask that you would crack our heart open and allow the Holy Spirit to wash over us and work its way in that we may be reminded once more that you are with us now and always. These things we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning, as we prepare to sing our final hymn, I would invite you to come if you have anything at all to pray about this morning, anything at all facing your future that you'd like to just leave at the altar and take and exchange the gift of the Holy Spirit, come to these kneelers and offer a prayer as we sing. We won't be disturbed. You can just come and pray. And know that if you'd like to dedicate your life to Jesus Christ this morning or perhaps rededicate it, you'll be welcomed if you'll come forward. And if you'd like to become a member of this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we invite you too to come forward. I'll meet you down front and we'll all welcome you. Our closing hymn today is 397. 397 in your hymnals. Would you stand with me, please? <laughs>
now may the love of God, our creator, the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, and the connection and communion of the saints ever after be with you this day and each day of your life. Go in peace. May God be with you until we meet again. Amen. Thank you.